And let me uh, introduce Jared. Jared Atchison is uh, no stranger to New Hope. He's, he's grown up here. He's spent his life here, and uh, he and Becky have three children, and uh, Jared works for the, the city of Clive, and um, is an amazing guy. He's got a lot of talents and gifts and abilities, but one of the things he's done in the last few years is studied, and uh, he's got his credentials, his uh, license to preach, and uh, just waiting for what God's uh, next step is for them. But I want you to welcome Jared he, as he brings the word tonight. Jared, we love you. We're proud of you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Jeff. It's such a privilege to be with you. Uh, I've been looking forward to this uh, for quite a while when Pastor asked me to, to speak. Uh, but I, I love this church. This is home. Uh, you guys are all family to me. Uh, but I just want to encourage something, you guys, with something real quick that I learned this afternoon. Um, as Pastor Luke was preaching this morning and talking about Gideon with uh, fighting with pots instead of swords, uh, I just want to encourage you, with those with, that are families, bring your kids to church because they're listening. My, my three-year-old nephew was here this morning, and he was playing in the pew and not really paying attention. And Pastor Luke said, fight with pots. And my dad said he whipped around, fight with pots? It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and so have your kids in church because they're, they're paying attention. They're, they're listening. I just wanted to encourage somebody with that because it's, it's important. Uh, it was a non-negotiable for me when I was growing up, but uh, I didn't have a choice. So we, we were at the, the Chi Alpha retreat this weekend, had a great time with the college students. Um, so I'm definitely feeling my age. Uh, I'm only 30, but it gets harder every single year uh, to do the youth events and the retreats. I know, I know. It does, though. My shoulder hurts. Played dodgeball for like two hours. My knee hurts. And I know, you just want me to shut up. But so I'm kind of tired, and I just figured that since I know, I know a lot of you, and you've known me since I was just a kid, but I figured, you know, since I'm tired, you guys won't mind if I just preach like this. <laughs> and uh, I want to talk to you guys tonight about uh, not sleeping on, on God. <sighs> but... That would be wrong if I did that. If I could fall asleep, I am legitimately tired. But how many times do we do that on God? We fall asleep on God. When we're supposed to be working, we're supposed to be doing things, and when we get bored in our life, we fall asleep or, or we're tired. We don't have any more energy. And we, we get, and for me, being, having grown up in the church and, and hearing, been in hundreds of services and, and all the camps and all the retreats, it gets so easy for us to just kind of shift into cruise control and, and we tend to fall asleep. But I'm here, to, the message that I have tonight is that we serve an exciting and an amazing God. That he, he is a God that spoke the world into existence. That's the God that we serve, not a God that, that is boring, not like the, the first period uh, Western philosophy teacher that I had in college that put me to sleep. Partially that was because I stayed up till, still 4.30 in the morning, but we won't talk about that. But our God is exciting. We shouldn't fall asleep on him. He's, he's constantly moving, constantly doing new things. He wants to do that in us and through us. And at, at the end of this service, uh, we're, we're going to spend just some time seeking him. Because he, he has a fresh word. He has something new, something exciting that he wants to do in each and every person that's in this room. And so I, I want to look at uh, Abraham tonight. And if you know anything about Abraham, he, he lived a very exciting life. He, he knew that his God was not boring. He was constantly living in faith and, and doing incredible things. And so there's three things that we can apply uh, from Abraham's life. First, he left something behind. Two, he was obedient. 
And three, he kept moving with God. So turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 12. And this is where we're first introduced to Abraham. So his his father has started this journey, uh, Terah. God has called Terah to leave his country. And they they have been been moving, and Terah dies. And so God is now calling Abraham and saying, I want you to pick up where your father left off. And so if if you're there, say, I'm ready. All right. You ready? Say, let's go. All right, starting in verse 1. The Lord said to Abram, leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless, bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all people on the earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left. As the Lord had told him, And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated, and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan, and they arrived there. They traveled through the land as far as the site of the great tree of Moreh at Shechem. At the time, the Canaanites were in the land. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he went on toward the hills east of Bethel and pitched his tent with, uh, and pitched his tent with Bethel on the east and Ai on, with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar to the Lord and called to, on the name of the Lord. Then Abram set out and continued toward the Negev. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would speak through me. God, that I would get out of the way and that you would move in the hearts of your people tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So the first thing that we see from Abraham is he left something behind. So the first point is this, if you're taking notes, the first step to living the life that you want is leaving the life you don't want. When God wants to take you to a new level, when God wants to do something new, he's going to ask you to leave something. When Jesus forgave the woman that was caught in adultery, he said, your sins are forgiven, now go and sin no more. This required the woman to leave her current way of life and to begin a new life, to turn from her ways and do something completely new. Uh, the, the, man, the example of a man and a woman b- becoming one and becoming married is, is a perfect example. Genesis 2.24 says, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. The Hebrew word for cleave or hold fast, uh, it means to cling, stick with. To, to follow closely. God calls us the, the bride of Christ. And so just like a newly married couple, they're often clingy to each other and it's, they're all over each other and it's kind of disgusting sometimes. But, you know, Becky and I, we didn't get that honeymoon stage because we had Brooklyn right away. And so I plan on being one of those old people that's all over Becky and, and getting my honeymoon stage in later, grossing some of the young people out. Praise God for that. But that's how we should be with, with God. We, we are his bride. And we are to cling to him as, as a husband and wife leave the families that they came from. And they come together and they start a new life. They start something brand new, a new journey with God. And they cling closely to him. And many of you, as we did baptisms tonight, you you showed that that has happened in your life. And, and I'm here to say that this is only the beginning. This is not the end. This is only the beginning of, of the excitement and the new things that God wants to do in your life. So God, God may be calling you to a new place. It might be a physical place, it, or it may be a, a change in your heart. As, as Abraham, as he had, he had dug in, in roots, he, he had wealth and, and family and, and all of these things. And God says, I want you to pull everything up and I want to start something new. And some of us, it might be an attitude. It might be something in our heart. It, it might be, uh, maybe it's you're, you're stretched too thin. 
God's saying, I want you to give something up so that, and uproot this so that something new can grow. Because we, if, we're, if we're too crowded or if we've got things in our heart that are other things that are growing, the stuff that God wants to grow can't grow there. It might be procrastination, complacency, laziness, a lack of motivation, or whatever it may be. What is God asking you to leave? Let it go. Leave it behind. The first step to, leave, to living the life that you want is leaving the life you don't want. The second point is this. Obedience to God is the pathway to the life you really want to live. Verse 4. So Abram left. I, I've read this story so many times, and I've always just kind of skimmed through that. But as I was studying, God was laying this message on my heart. Those three words just jumped, out at, jumped off the page. Because those three words, they don't take up much space, but that's what changed Abram's destiny, was his obedience to leave, to do what God had, had asked him to do. What if, what if Abram had never been obedient? What if, what if he had never said yes? I, don't, I believe that we wouldn't read of Abraham in the Bible. We wouldn't grow up singing the childhood song, Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. Everybody do. I am one of them, and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Right arm, left arm, right foot, left foot, chin up, turn around, sit down. I learned something in Sunday school. <laughs> God had a plan, so if Abraham would have said no, God's plan would have still happened, because he's God. But he would have chose somebody else. It would have been Father Bill or Father George or somebody. It wouldn't have been Father Abraham. But because of Abram's obedience, it changed his identity. He was renamed, and it then changed his destiny. And he became a part of God's story, because through Abraham, God brought the Israelites Through the Israelites, God brought Jesus. And through Jesus, he brought our salvation. And God, Abraham, was able to be a part of that story because of his obedience. I think of of the disciples, uh, James, uh, all of the the disciples. I, I don't think that we give them enough credit for what they did, for what they left, because I, I can't prove this, but I have to believe that some of them have pretty good lives. Matthew was very wealthy. He was a tax collector. He had cheated people, so he was a very wealthy man. Uh, Peter, James, John, Andrew, they, they were fishermen. They, had, they ran the family business. I think things were okay, but, but the Gospel of Mark records that when Jesus called Peter and Andrew, it says at once they followed him. And then Jesus walks a little farther, and he sees James and John. And the Bible says that immediately they left what they were doing and they followed him. Imagine yourself as, as Zebedee. He, you're, you're in the boat with your sons, James and John, and, and you're mending your nets, you're cleaning fish, you're doing these things, and, and this guy comes walking down the Sea of Galilee that you've never seen before, and he's with Andrew and that punk Peter that's up the, up the lake that always fighting everyone and kind of a hothead and, and he's your competitor. And this guy, um, I had this thought today, why every picture we have of Jesus, why he looks like a hippie. I, don't know, I just had that thought today. Why? So hippie Jesus comes walking down and, and he asks your boys, your sons, get up and follow me. And they get up and they leave. And you're like, you boneheads never listen to me when I ask you to do something. i got to ask you a thousand times. But this guy that is walking with our competitors, you just get up and you follow him. Now, that's either obedience or it's insanity. I don't know. But I want to bring something to your attention about James and John, particularly John. Uh, they had a nickname. And that nickname was the Sons of Thunder. I love that nickname. I think that's a sweet nickname. I think of Thor, any Marvel fans in the room. 
you get the surround sound turned up and <laughs> calls down lightning towards the man. But the son of thunder, so as you study James and John, they, they're hotheads. They have tempers. Uh, they're always looking for a fight. When, when Jesus goes, there's a story where Jesus goes to a place and, and the disciples and they're being mistreated. And James and John are like, Jesus, do you want us to call on fire and kill them all? Jesus goes, no, just calm down. I'm going to do that in the end, but it's not time for you yet. You just calm down. But I, I get this picture of James and John. They're just those guys that just, come on, let's go. Let's fight. And that's their personalities. But James, or, or John, I'm sorry, goes from being known as a son of thunder. We now know him as the apostle of love. If you read his gospel and, and you read his epistles, his letters, and you read Re- Revelation, they're full of truth and they're straightforward, but they're laced with grace and love. Those are two things that John, he didn't possess those. And because of John's obedience, he left the old way of life, his old way of life, and Jesus gave him a new identity. When you're obedient to follow him, he changes your identity, and your identity changes your destiny. You might be in this room, and, and you've assumed a false identity. You've had an identity laid on you that, that is not from God. Maybe you earned it. Maybe it's your reputation. But God's got something different. He's got a new identity for you. Maybe you've been called unworthy, unwanted, unloved, not good enough. But God wants to say, no, your identity in me, if you say yes to me, it's loved, it's chosen, it's called, it's equipped, it's son, it's daughter. That is your identity. And when you assume your Christ-like identity, it, change, it changes your destiny. Abraham and John, they were just ordinary, but they lived fresh, exciting lives because they were obedient to what God had asked of them. And God may be asking you to do something, to leave something, to change your heart. Are you going to be obedient to do it? God, God has made the first move. It's now up to us to be obedient and allow him to work in our lives. So obedience to God is the pathway to the life you really want to live. My last point is this. Remember, but don't remain. So if you look back in your text, you see six times words such as left, set out, traveled through, went on, continued forward. Abraham is constantly moving. Now, he, he makes a point to worship God. He makes a point to build altars and to praise God because we were created to do that. We must praise God. First Chronicles 16, 8 says, Give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done. Luke nineteen forty. If they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. So I'm not making light of that, that we shouldn't, that we just keep moving from the next thing to the next thing and, and forget what God has done. We must praise him. We're able to trace Abraham's steps because of the altars that he built. He, he knew he, that was a priority to him, but the point I want to make is that even though he praised God, even though he built an altar, he did not stay in that place and allow his walk to become stagnant and stale in yesterday's miracle. Keep moving on with God because our God is constantly moving. He's constantly doing new things. He, he's working here and there. He's I'm, I'm horrible at, at multitasking, but my God is not. He can handle it all. When we stay in the same place spiritually, when we live in what God did yesterday, it becomes so easy for our, for our walk to become more of a religion than a relationship. Because we, there, there's nothing wrong with tradition. There's nothing wrong with, with doing certain things. But when, when, we, when it becomes so more of a religion and, and not, a, 
a moving, evolving relationship like our human relationships are, we get stale, we get stagnant. It, it be, we become like the Pharisees, that they were so ritualistic because their faith was not moving and they weren't keeping in step with God. It's, Satan's not scared of religious people. In fact, he's okay with you being a Christian and, and going through the motions, doing some good here and there, being involved in the church. But what he does not want is for you to be searching every day for something new from God. Because those are the people that God speaks to. Those are the people that God reveals himself to. Those are the people that are reaching out to somebody else that they don't know. Those are the people that have God-sized dreams, God-sized passions. The list is endless because we serve an endless God. Those are the people that, that scare Satan. I want you to ask yourself, when you get up in the morning, what does the devil say of you? Does he say, ah, oh, guys, take the day off. Jared's not going to do anything today. He hasn't spent time with his God. Or when I get up in the morning, does, does the enemy say, uh-oh, Jared, don't get out of bed. You don't want to get out of bed. Guys, we've got to work overtime today. Jared's getting up. And he's talking to that God of his again. That's what I want hell to say. I want hell to know who I am. Because I'm spending each and every day with my God. And he's giving me new orders, new marching orders of what he wants me to do today. Who he wants me to talk to today. Yesterday's manna will go stale. But today's manna is just what we need today. Many of us stay in yesterday's miracle, what he did last year, what he did 20 years ago, what he did 30 years ago. Those are all great things, and we should remember them, but he's got something fresh today, something for us today. And, and he's saying, yesterday was great, but I've got something today. Let's experience it together. Let's not get stuck in a rut and say, God, I'm moving on with you. I want something fresh, I want something real, I want something new. Remember, but don't remain. Worship team, would you come? John 10.10 10 says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. See, Satan doesn't want you to live a full life. He, he wants you to, to kind of relax, Take it easy. Become bored and complacent in your faith. And so you, you end up falling asleep. Because he, he, he's okay with that. He doesn't have to worry about the person that's sleeping. But God, Jesus says that I want them to have a full life. A life that, it's, is, that is exciting, that is vibrant. That, that's what God wants of us. I'm not saying that everything in our life will be easy if, if we say yes to God, if, if we live this way, but we'll be, we'll be fulfilled no matter what happens or what we do. If we sit around and just let time pass by, we will quickly become bored with this Christian life. Our faith will become stagnant. So think of a, think of a pond. If it sits... It, it becomes shallow, it becomes full of algae, it begins to stink, it, it be, all the fish die in it. it, it can't produce life. But if you think of a stream, it's crisp, it's cool, it, it, it produces life, life thrives around a moving river. What's the difference? Movement. Movement. It's not staying in the same place. The water is constantly moving downstream and it produces life and life flourishes and, and is vibrant. It's the same way with our lives. If we aren't on the move, we get bored. We, get, we just kind of go through the motions. We've got to stay moving with our God in order to keep our lives fresh and vibrant. God wants to take us individually to a new level. 
He wants to do some incredible things in our hearts. He wants to do some incredible things in this church and in this community. But it starts with a fresh and a vibrant life that's going after him every day. So is God asking you to leave something behind? What do you need to leave here? Is it an attitude? Is is it a a heart problem? I I don't know what it is. And are you going to be obedient to do that? Because I know that in my life there's things that God is asking me to do. And I've disobeyed. I haven't done it for multiple reasons, fear, whatever. But don't miss out on what God wants to do in you and through you because of your disobedience. Or maybe you've just kind of, you've kind of gotten to a a routine and just kind of going through the motions. And you've kind of let your your faith and your walk with God kind of just kind of on cruise control. But tonight God wants to refresh that. He wants to do something new. He wants to do something fresh. Every head bowed, every eye closed. First, if you're here and you've never been made new. You've never left your old way of life to start with me, or maybe you have and, and you've backslid and, and you know that tonight if you were to die you would not make it to heaven if there's anybody in this room that's you I want you to raise your hand right now you want to say yes to Jesus for the first time Secondly, maybe you're hearing God, he's tugging on your heart, but there's things in your life that you need to, you need to change. You need, something needs to be different, or you need to be obedient to something, or maybe you just need to soak in his presence.